I'd like to welcome you all uh, this evening to In Conservation With. Um, my name is David Lindo, and I say, as, I, as I said before, we have sponsors, which I should have said now as opposed to before, and they are Leica Sports Optic, uh, as well as um, King's Place Music Foundation, and this is part of their Nature Unwrapped season. And my guest today is uh, Melissa Harrison, who is well known amongst the Twitterati. Um, she's on Twitter quite a lot, as I, uh, as I see myself, because we talk on Twitter quite a bit. We've never actually met, have we, Melissa? We haven't. We haven't had that pleasure yet. You um, haven't been here. <laughs> true. I mean, Melissa's just telling me now, I missed my golden opportunity this spring to hook up with her on a podcast. But unfortunately, um, I wasn't to be around. And that's what, that's what stopped it. But I'm hoping that one day our paths will cross. I hope so. So the part, well, one, one of the main reasons why Melissa and I are talking today, and I'm, she's been sort of talking about it a lot, is because of this. This is her latest offering. Um, and also she has a podcast of the same name, or had a podcast during lockdown up to October, I believe. Um, That's right. And it was, and this is, you I say, um, I suppose a collection of your monthly nature notes um, yep. from the Times. The Times, that's right. But before we, I mean, just another thing, guys, to let you know, this is not going to be a book review as such. It's going to be a conversation, as with the title. It's, it's a conversation about, well, it's conservation about conversation. Um, but basically, we want to talk about a whole different range of things. Um, there's one burning thing I want to get out of the way. For me, it's a white elephant in the room. And it's something that I've noticed you've touched on in other interviews, but I want to talk about Mixed Mag very quickly. Um, <laughs> Melissa Max worked for a magazine called Mixed Mag, which is a dance music magazine. Um, I was so delighted when I heard that because I thought before then that you and I have some kind of, well, we have a lot of similarities in terms of the stuff you say, I think, oh, actually, I, I think the same too. And then I thought, you worked at Mixmag. Do you, you still work there or what, what's happened there? Sadly, uh, COVID has killed Mixmag, which is very sad. It's, it, it's the, the print section um, has gone as of April. Um, you know, it's a, a magazine for the dance music industry and there is no dance music industry at the moment. The clubs are shut, there's no festivals. All of the advertisers were, you know, festivals, um, mixes, DJs, it was all connected to the, the hospitality industry which has gone for the time being. So there was no content and no advertisers. So, um, you know, 34 years of dance music history just uh, pulled the plug overnight. It's really sad. And I was there for 13 years of it, so. How long? 13 years. Okay. I've got a revelation for you. Go on. I worked at Mixed Mag myself. Shut up! I was the advertising director um, back in the early, sorry, the, yeah, the early 90s. Mr. No way. Himself hired me. I worked at Burnham Beaches and also in Soho. And I sold advertising on that magazine. That's oh, how connected we are. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I used to be a DJ myself. Did you? What did you play? Dance music, but a lot of it was, um, sorry, probably alienating 90% of Sorry, the everyone. <laughs> But it was, in fact, house that was influenced by disco and jazz and that sort of stuff. Um, I used to play at places like, I used to play in Fabric and all sorts of places. And also in LA and in, in Italy and places like that. I so was, when it's over, we need to go out. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Have a dance. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, let's bring everyone back into the room. Um, now, Melissa, you, uh, one thing I'd always like to know, I mean, you, you grew up in Surrey. Um, and you ran around looking at life. When did you actually first become aware of nature? I mean, had, was there sort of a, as my American friends would say, a spark moment? Was there a spark moment? Or was it something you just grew up with? I think um, it's really easy to tell these stories, isn't it? In, in a way that makes it sound really pat, as if these things have got a beginning and a middle and an end. But actually, in the late 70s and early 80s, most kids played out, outdoors all day and played outdoors unsupervised. And so nature, it wasn't something you got into. There weren't kids who were into nature in the way that there are now. It was the norm. It was the norm that 
kids are out outdoors all day. There wasn't that much indoors to, to do. Um, there wasn't, you know, programming on the telly that was suitable for kids in the daytime. There wasn't, you know, there just wasn't that much. So most kids I knew were outdoors. We'd play on building sites, we'd dam streams, you know, we'd be out in the woods. And so being interested in nature wasn't like a positive choice. It was it was just the, the background to everything, really, for most of the people that I knew. Um, and Surrey, you know, it's not, um, it was a very in-betweeny place. It, it wasn't the rural countryside with farms, but it wasn't an urban environment either. And there were loads of places you could just spend the day, you know, in the woods that are now, I go back there now and it's, you know, everywhere's fenced off, everywhere's private, it's golf courses, it's paddocks now, but it was quite, there were a lot of sort of wildish corners there that you could explore. So it was, it was a backdrop to my life, but also I was a very lonely child. Um, I'm the youngest of six, but the others all a lot older than me. Um, so I, I didn't get to play with them that much. Um, so there's a five year gap between me and the next child and 15 between me and the eldest. Um, so I spent a lot of time alone and I was bullied at school um, pretty consistently. So nature for me as well, it was a consolation. There was a feeling of, I used to play this game. I don't want to get out the tiny violins here because, you know, it all worked out fine. But I used, to, I used to tell myself that there were particular trees that really liked me and that they were pleased when I climbed them and they liked seeing me and they didn't like the other kids in my head, you know, they only liked me. And so what I was doing was using nature to feel accepted. And I can see that now and I feel really sorry for that little girl now. But at the time I wouldn't have said I was lonely. I thought lonely was something that old people were who lived alone, not kids with a house full of brothers and sisters, you know? So I, I didn't really know that I was, I can see it now. So basically, it was a bit of a sanctuary. I mean, I can relate to that because myself, as a kid, I, I grew up in, in, in North London, North West London. And even though I've got a younger sister, I was spending a lot of time on my own. I mean, I wasn't bullied at school, unfortunately, but I kind of found, because I wasn't happy at home, basically, I found a lot of solace out in a building site or, you know, because that's what, that was my countryside. Yeah, I, I, it, I'm horrified when I look back at some of the things I used to go up to. <laughs> Terrible dangers, clambering around in half-built houses, and just, just the stuff we got up to that our parents didn't know. But then everyone did. You know, you went out on your bikes and you fell off and you fell into mill ponds and you fell out of trees and everyone had their arm in a, cast, a plaster cast. Like all kids broke things, right? In the 70s and 80s, everyone broke something. <laughs> and now you rarely see a kid. And that's surely, I mean, it's a good thing, but it's a, it's a slightly sad thing as well in that, you know, when I, when I was living in South London, I'd go around Tooting Common and you'd see parents with their kids and they will have taken their child to climb a tree. And the kid is up the tree looking a bit self-conscious and the adults are standing underneath looking up and checking they're okay and no one's having a good time <laughs> you know no risks are being taken but no one's having fun either and I think one of the things that that solitary play or unsupervised play did was it taught you to, to uh it taught you what risk was and how to manage it and so actually we were we were pretty safe you know yeah I mean I remember you know going back to what you said I mean we used to make, uh, myself and my, my mate at the time, my best mate, we used to make bombs. Um, something that you'd never even even whisper about now, but we'd go to the chemist. I remember once, because he was a, really into science, he went to, we went to the chemist and we asked for this, this uh, chemical and the chemist said, why do you want a liter of it, a gallon of it? Oh, we're just, you know, <laughs> but obviously he didn't say it to us, but in the end we, we kind of made it with aerosol cans, but, it's all about, as you say, taking risks and, and sort of moving through. You'd be on a watch list for that now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, I mean, I haven't even sort of broken down who you are in terms of uh, what you've done and stuff. I mean, I'm sure most of the Zoomers here know. I mean, she, uh, Melissa's uh, a hugely awarded um, writer. Um, 
you contribute your monthly nature notebook column to the Times. For the Times, should I say, you write for, you write for the FT Weekend, The Guardian, and The New Statesman. And uh, uh, your most recent novel, All uh, Among the Barley, was the UK winner of the European Union Prize of Lit for Literature and all that sort of stuff. It's all incredible what you've done. I'm Probably sure. the last UK winner as well. Say again? The last? The last UK winner, because wow. we're not going to be eligible anymore. That's true, yeah. Anyway, that's another subject. You describe yourself as a, obviously as a woman, uh, a novelist, a feminist, a, a nature geek. One thing I've always wondered, I mean, you know, in these days when we're kind of noticing or hopefully noticing more the diversity or lack of, um, what is it like being a woman in this world, A, as a, as a writer, and B, in the sort of, the, the nature, in inverted commas, world? Hmm. Um. I'm lucky in a way in that I don't, because I'm not a sort of proper birder or, you know, I don't consider myself part, you know, really in that world. I don't spend a lot of time in hides. I don't spend a lot of time at twitches or the kind of places where I know that a lot of women feel excluded or feel um, that they don't fit in or, or feel some friction. And, and so I, I'm not really in that, those situations. I spend a lot of time by myself. I walk a lot by myself. And that's where I notice it, really. I think, um, you know, it becomes hard to perceive because you just grow up, it's just normal. But I had to, I had to work really hard to allow myself to go out and walk as much as I do by myself. I had to do a lot of psychological, I had to push through a lot of barriers in, inside myself that had been put there by growing up and being told that I was unsafe all the time and that I was putting myself at risk. Whereas, you know, we know now that women are most at risk in their own homes, but we're not telling women not to stay at home and get married and start families, but we are telling women that they shouldn't go out after dark and they shouldn't walk by themselves and they shouldn't do X, Y, and Z and all these other things. And I knew I didn't want to live like that, but I still had to, unpick a lot of those fears that were not rational or were, were out of proportion but had been put inside me and felt really true um, and that was hard and I still feel sometimes what I feel now is not afraid of strangers but I feel very visible um, so a few years ago I was researching a book and I, I wanted to walk up the A5 I wanted to do a four-day walk up the A5 um, and just to see what it was like and I felt incredibly watched and looked at and you know some people just stop their cars and question me what are you doing because I was walking in a part of the country which wasn't it wasn't like a hiking place. it wasn't like a beauty spot so what what the hell could I be doing there and I felt really just incredibly visible all I wanted to do was go back to London and melt into a crowd and disappear and it was hard psychological work but nobody actually stopped me doing it i didn't actually get attacked or harassed or anything it was all in my head it was all you know it's all kind of self-generated um and now i've pretty much fought through that and i do what i like and i go i walk at night and you know and these things are not without risk but then everything we do carries risk and I'm not going to live any a life that's in any way smaller than I want to. So it, it, there's that, I think. I mean, you live in Suffolk now. Do you feel safer, in inverted commas, walking around at night, uh, for example, you know, during the day or whatever, when you're doing your podcast? Do you feel, do you even think about danger? Do you mean, when do you you live mean under... danger being attacked by another person? Do you mean that kind of danger? Well, I don't, I don't I yeah, you know, I, think, I, I worry that I might um, fall over and twist my ankle or, you know, injure myself and not, there not be anyone around. But I've got my mobile phone. I don't spend a lot of time thinking that someone's going to jump out and attack me, no. That's good. Um, now, you describe yourself as a novelist before even describing yourself as a nature writer. Um, I presume there's a distinction. Well... The first book I wrote was a novel, but that was really because I 
I wasn't sure I could be a nature writer because I wasn't an expert, which is something I've, I've talked about a bit. Um, so I put all the things that I wanted to say into a work of fiction, and that was a, a novel called Clay, which was set in South London. Um, and people really didn't know what to make of it. And a lot of the reviews were kind of, well, it's lovely, but is it fiction or non-fiction? Is it nature writing? Is it an urban pastoral? Is it, you know, we just, a nature novel? We don't really know. And people were a bit bemused. But I think, I think, you know, there have been other things published since then. I think people are understanding that you can write about nature in lots and lots of different ways. And nature writing now includes poetry, travel writing, psychogeography. Um, you know, it's a really broad church. When did you realise you could write? Oh, well. That's a hard question. Because I knew that I could write descriptively when I was in primary school and a, a teacher. It's a story I tell in the introduction of the book and it, I'd forgotten about it for years until I was writing this introduction. Um, a teacher called Mrs Jessett kept me back after class and said that I'd written a good description of a, of a pond in winter and it meant a lot to me. So I, I sort of knew that and I took it inside myself but that isn't the same as being a, a good writer, it's not the same as being able to write a book or do anything that anyone else is going to pay you money for or want to read. You know, it was just like a thing I did when I was a kid. So I had this little grain of hope. I didn't really know what to do with it. And it was complicated by the fact that my mum uh, wanted to write. And my mum's great ambition was to be published. And, uh, and she wasn't. But she, my whole childhood was dominated by my mum at the typewriter and the clacking sound of the keys and the pages piling up and her sending them off and getting these rejection letters and I don't think I could have tried had she not died. I don't think I could have challenged her. It was hers, it was her thing and she wanted it so badly. And I think for me to come along and just go, oh, well, I'm going to be a writer now, would it, I couldn't have done it. I just couldn't have done it. So it was a couple of years after she died um, that I began to try. And I was terrified when I started. I was so scared that I would fail and that I wouldn't be able to produce anything that anyone might say something nice about, like my teacher had when I was little. And for a long time, it stopped me even trying, you know, I didn't even write in private. I didn't do anything because I was so scared of not being good enough. So it was better not to try because then I could always tell myself, oh, I could have been a writer, you know. I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't want to write because <laughs> it was too risky. Um, and it was very hard for the first few years. It still is hard, but I remember it feeling like I didn't want to do it. I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I was making myself do it. And it felt like holding your hand on a radiator until you until you burn and then going back and forcing your hand back on the radiator, just walking in the room and sitting down at my laptop hurt so much. I hated it. I hated it every second of it. So what is it like now? How do you feel now as being a writer? Do you, do you, do you accept yourself as a writer now? Oh, you know, you think, you think you, you, you write one book and you think, oh, that means I can do it now. But you start another and it, you're just back at the start again because it's a different book and you've got to learn a whole new set of things. What I find easy is journalism. So if someone gives me a deadline and a subject and it's come from someone else, it doesn't, it doesn't cost me anything in the same way. And I can sit down and I'm a, I'm a really good journalist. I've been working in magazines, all sorts of magazines for years. So writing, you know, 1300 words on X 
subject coming to X conclusion, filing it on Friday. I don't miss deadlines. I don't overwrite. I don't underwrite. Really professional. It's the stuff that comes from here, from inside, that costs still. But I think the reason, I think things... Graham Greene said, go where the fire is hottest. And I think the stuff that matters sometimes hurts to, to get near or to get out. Yeah, it does take a lot of uh, guts, I suppose, to... Really scary to put yourself out there. And it's like having a job where your annual review is in the national press. You, you put something out there and people write about it. This thing that's come out of your heart and soul... And, you know, they, they may well tear it apart in public for everyone to read. What is that about? Why am I doing that? It's crazy. <laughs> do, you, um, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think of yourself now as a nature writer or are you still... Because what I'm trying to think, what I'm trying to ask you really is uh, if the books you write, I mean, for example, this beautiful book, for me, it's a lot of nature writing. Are you do, you, do you consider yourself a nature writer or are there, or, or shouldn't they be labels, but you're just a writer? Well, I think it's, nature is the, the thing that drives all of my books because I feel really evangelical about connecting people to the natural world. And I think there's different ways that that can happen. And one of those ways is literature. You know, there are, there are loads of ways in to getting people to, to have a, a, a really felt connection to species and to place and to engage them in the work that needs to be done. And this is one of those routes and it's, it's a route that I know about and it's one of the routes that I came to, to the natural world through was through my mum reading me loads and loads of books about the natural world. And so I choose to use my voice in service of this idea. And, and this, you know, this drives pretty much everything I do um, because I think it can be really powerful. I think that stories um, can bypass our prejudices and they can make us, if you can get a reader on side to, you know, get that reader to trust you, you can take them places, and make them feel things that they wouldn't otherwise. And that's really valuable. So whether it's fiction, or non-fiction or journalism for me it's all working in the same direction yeah i mean the stuff that i read of yours i mean I, I i love your style i love how you describe things i find it really easy to engage with i love the 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 juxtaposition between city life and nature and the fact that you bring it together um which i really think is great um your book um rain uh four walks in english weather I thought was an amazing concept because I love walking in the rain too. I've got so many um, memories of birding. I remember once taking a group of people in my local patch, Wormwood Scrubs, um, one May morning. It was peeing down in the rain. I was thinking, I hope they don't show up. And of course, there were 10 people at the station, so I had to go through with it. And we were walking through the driving rain across the football pitch. I was thinking, what can I show these guys? And all of a sudden, this bird flew in front of us with, with a longish tail. I thought, oh, it's a parakeet. I thought, hang on a minute. It's on its own. It's battling against the wind heading north. And I suddenly realised it was a cuckoo. <gasps> no. In central London, in the pouring rain. And it was like, it was a beautiful moment. And I think... It. You often get the place to yourself and you see more wildlife because there aren't that many people around. Absolutely. And I found it very, very, very you know, enlightening to actually go through that. Um, there is a question, actually. Um, someone, um, Charlotte, I haven't got your second name, Charlotte, but she's asking, any tips for getting into nature writing? Oh, well, that depends if you want to do it for the pleasure of it or if you want to be published. And, and, and I think when you, for any writer, it's worth sorting that out first. You know, when people, uh, people are, who do watercolours or drawing, they're not all trying to, um, they're not all trying to win, you know, a massive art prize. People do it for the pleasure. Whereas with writing, people feel that you have to be published in order to be a writer. And I don't think that's true. So if what you want to do is enjoy writing about nature, then get into a daily habit. 
don't feel it has to be a notebook. I mean, I do a lot. I take a lot of notes on my phone. I take photos and I use, I use an app uh, called Day One. Um, if you want to be published, that's a whole different conversation. Um, but I would say that authenticity is the most valuable thing you can bring to nature writing. So don't be looking at the market and saying, oh, well, no one's done a book about shrews yet, so I'll do a book about shrews. If you don't love shrews and you haven't felt connected with shrews since you were a child, it's going to come out flat and dead. So don't do it. You need to, you need to go inwards first and find out who you are and what you need to say and who you need to say it to. That's where it starts. It doesn't start out there in bookshops. It starts inside. It's interesting. I read a Guardian article a few years ago. Um, they were interviewing several big main um, writers, novelists, asking them about their process. And most of them said, well, I, my plan is I get up in the morning, I have breakfast, give the kids breakfast, take them to school, come back, and my plan is to work from 11 o'clock until the kids come back from school. I might go out for lunch, maybe that's about it. And when it comes down to it, it never turns out that way. If they turn up, you know, they come home and they're, watching, they're looking at Facebook and what have you, you know, don't start writing until 10 minutes before the kids come back. Mm -hmm. Have you got a process yourself? Is there a sort of a process you go through when you're thinking about, you know, the, 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 the pieces of... Yeah. You know, uh, well, I try, I mean, so I need to, the caveat here is that I think people love to hear tips from writers. And actually, I think tips from writers are really unhelpful because the more time you spend trying to follow someone else's process, the less time you're spending working out what you need in your day and your life and what writing looks like for you. And I know that sounds really glib, but, you know, I did it at the beginning as well. You know, do I need to write longhand? Do I need to uh, get up at five in the morning and write while I'm still half asleep? Do I, what are all the tricks? Is there a trick? What's the trick? And actually, the trick is you have to get to know yourself and you have to, you know, the process of becoming a writer is kind of the process of becoming a, a human. You, you have to be in, in a good, open and honest, truthful relationship with yourself. Um, and you have to remember that a lot of things are writing that don't look like writing. You know, wandering around outside is writing. Lying awake at night is writing. Watching, sometimes watching crappy TV is writing because you don't know what little scene you're going to see that you're going to go, oh, that's a brilliant image. I need that. There's lots of, there's a lot of living and thinking and feeling that goes into writing that isn't sitting at your desk. Having said that, you do have to show up at your desk as well. You have to be at the desk in order to get it out and down. But, you know, there's days when I, I sit here where I'm sitting now talking to you and I might spend two or three hours pissing about on the internet and it just doesn't happen. And I would have been better off closing my laptop and going out for a walk. <laughs> I can't give you easy answers because there aren't any and people will find their own way. And that's, that's yeah. the truth. Your podcast, um, I mean, I've listened to a couple of the uh, episodes. I mean, that was a very successful thing for you. What? It was mad. <laughs> 16,500 people at its peak. Wow. Listeners all around the world. What motivated you to do that podcast? Um, by the way, the podcast um, was also of the same name as the book. Um, what motivated you to do that? And it seems I've noticed that you have a musician friend, which you, Peter, perhaps, was he yeah. involved in that? And he yeah. seems to have a major influence in a lot of things, or well, some of the things you've done. So he uh, is, used to be a designer at Mixmag um, and he's also a drum and bass artist and we, when we worked together we used to listen to podcasts a lot together so he'd listen on his headphones and I'd listen on my headphones. So we've been listening to podcasts together for quite a long time and uh, I'd been talking to Faber, they wanted me to do a four episode podcast to promote the book which was going to be a very glossy thing with studio guests and you know just me and a producer I didn't know in a studio and then Covid happened and suddenly there were no studios and there was no traveling and I was sitting here surrounded by woods and fields that I could get straight out into and feeling incredibly 
privileged. Whereas my niece, who's uh, medically high risk, was isolating in a one bed in Wimbledon with no outside space. She had an alleyway she could stand in to feel the sun on her face. And the woman in the downstairs flat started complaining about her standing out there. So she ended up just in the flat. And I just thought, I need to share this. I need to share what I have here. I feel incredibly lucky. So I got on the phone to Faber and bullied them to post me a field recorder. And nine days later, we had the first episode out and we had no idea what we were doing. Never done a po never made a podcast before. No idea what it would mean to do 27 episodes every single Monday. It was a lot of work. <laughs> But it was a lot of fun as well. And I think people took it in the spirit it was offered, which is this is imperfect, but we're doing our best and it's a gift to you. It's not going to have ads. It's not, you don't have to pay for it. This is just a gift at this really scary time to try and keep you in touch with the seasons and what's going on in the world. I'm really proud of it. Yeah. So I feel slightly choked up. I am really proud of it. I'm more proud of it than anything else I've done. So you should be. <laughs> are you are you a country girl or a city girl? I'm both. Both till the day I die. <laughs> when I moved to Suffolk, the plan was to be here and London. And that obviously hasn't been possible. I've managed to get in once or twice. Um, I don't want to choose. I don't think you have to be a cat person or a dog person either. I think, you know, all of us can be complex. All of us can be I wear lots of hats and be lots of people and I, I love I love London and I miss it you know my heart is there I when I, I learned how to really tune into the, the the nature that was there you know part of the thing that you and I have in common is this understanding that you can be incredibly plugged into nature in a really urban space it's not the countryside is where the nature is and you have to drive there you know a city like London is heaving with amazing things to look at and connect to. And so I wasn't, you know, having a really bad time there and now I'm having a lovely time in Suffolk. You know, it's, I, I want and I need both. I love, I love the, um, the connection you make with the urban wildlife. I love that. I mean, that's, part of, you know, my own heart, basically. But why do you think people have such a, make such a distinction between the countryside and urban. I have this all my life in terms of talking about urban nature and people just can't get their heads around it. No. I think it's, it's part of the lazy binaries that humans just do. We just find these shortcuts. We divide almost everything we see into two and then decide that one of those, one of those pair is good and one of, those pair, one of the pair is bad. And it, it's so reductive and lazy and thoughtless. And I think also, you know, we, as a species, we've, we've urbanized very recently. And in this country, we urbanized first and we urbanized incredibly quickly. You know, it was, it was a couple of generations. We went from almost everyone being connected to land, you know, working in the fields or, or owning those fields or whatever, to we're now, what, 87% of us in urban areas. And that happened really quickly. And I think I think we're still recovering from that. I think we, um, we haven't understood, we, ha we, 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 we create the city as this kind of dreadful machine, like, you know, like it's still, you know, the middle of the industrial revolution and there's smoke pouring out of chimneys and everything's covered in grime and there are chimney sweeps. I mean, you know, that's sort of still what we, what we think. And that's not the case, you know. You look in the center of London and we, you know, the, the, even the Thames is full of life. We haven't caught up. Yeah. I mean, I've heard you speak before and you, you, you come across as being a believer in local patches and getting to love your local area, which I totally can buy into. But how can you get people in general? How can you get members of the public? I mean, reading, you know, your accounts of your life in, in London and then into the countryside, it's great. But how do you get people to kind of see the same things? How do you get them to see that? Their, their house on Streatham High Street is also part of this great mm. universe called the world, called the environment, you know. How can you get people to understand their connection it's to that? Really hard. And, you know, I have to check myself a lot because the, the thing that I know how to do is, is words. 
And so this is my, my routine that I, you know, I'm trying to do it through words and stories and, and all kinds of writing. But, you know, let's be honest, that's quite a bourgeois, quite limited world. And so, you know, when I was in Streatham, I was volunteering with a tiny little grassroots organisation that was um, taking kids to do lessons in little parks. And they were doing some, you know, habitat restoration and things, and butterfly counts, things like that. And honestly, you know, some of these kids, the things they were worrying about was whether they were in the wrong postcode and they were going to be in danger. They were worried about was there going to be any tea on the table when they got home? And for a middle class woman, white woman like me to go, oh, but do you not really care about this butterfly? You know, you have to get the other things in place first. People are dealing with things that are very close to them and that, you know, I can barely imagine that if you, if you don't address the structural problems first, why should people feel connected? Why should people, you know, donate to your fundraiser or visit your, your park? You know, we have, to, we have to take this stuff into account. It's real and it's pressing. And, you know, reading a couple of nice books isn't going to solve it. Yeah, that's a question that I mean, a lot of people have been trying to answer. I mean, for me personally, I think it's all those things. Plus, and I keep on going on about this, but I think it's also the way that the media portray nature. Um, mm. Middle of nowhere, something you can't access. Something that's scary. So a lot of the kids we were working with thought it was dirty and frightening. So they thought they'd get diseases from picking up feathers. Um, they thought bugs would bite them, you know. And you look at the scare stories in the tabloids and sometimes in the big papers as well, you know. What is it now? It's, it's uh, killer hornets or something. What was it? M murder wasps was the recent one, wasn't it? Murder wasps. I mean, for God's sakes. <laughs> murder, please. Yeah, it's incredible. Obviously, nature uh, has now been sort of connected to the, to, the, I suppose, helping people overcome mental um, problems and help, you know, with the mental well-being. When mm. I suppose most of us knew that for, for some time. Um, what's been your experience in that regard? Well, it's great to see the research actually stacking up now and telling us what we all already knew. And I think it's not, for me, it's not so much that nature is, is good for us in those kind of ways. It's being out of nature that's bad for us. We've evolved to be in relationship with all sorts of things, you know, from tiny fungal spores to patterns of light on our retinas to particular smells to changes in temperature. That's, that's what our human body needs to, to do and be in. And it's the lack of those things that's harming us rather, you know, so our norm is to be surrounded by all of this information that we're taking in in ways that we're only starting to, to understand. Um, for me, when I first moved to, to London, I was really nature deprived, not because of London, but because I didn't know how to find the nature in it. So I had a few years at the beginning um, where I was living in an awful flat with a steel lined front door that I still gosh, I just can't believe I lived in that flat now above a car dealership. And I got a bus to and from work and there were no trees at all on the route. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. And I became more and more depressed and I didn't, I didn't know it was anything to do with nature. I was 21, 22, and, you know, I wasn't really, I was in, still in that period where I didn't really care about nature. I'd grown up with it and then moved away from it and got into like boys and, you know, clubbing and stuff. And it was only going to Dartmoor that I felt this, I felt it rush back, this thing that I knew I needed. And then I began trying to find ways to find it in London. And it was all there waiting for me. I just didn't know where, I just didn't know how to plug into it. And that, you know, and suddenly London became a completely different place. 2020 will be remembered as being one of the weirdest years ever. Um, it's been good, has it? <laughs> um, and also, I think it seems as though people kind of connected to nature during, especially during the first lockdown, 
do you think that connection is long lived or do you well, think that once, once people kind of get back to near normality they'll forget about the fact that they were connected i i really hope so i really really hope so i've got friends who are not in any way interested in nature who have been texting me all year about a blackbird they've seen in their garden or you know a nest that they had or whatever it is these are people who just you know just it's not part of their life at all and it really has been this year and, and why you would walk away from that feeling of joy I don't know perhaps some people will but it's surely it's got to be hard to forget that you had a nest or that or that you you know a lot of people I know have discovered little parks that they didn't even know were around the corner from them you're not you're surely not gonna just wipe that out I don't know. I can't say. I hope so. I hope it stays. And a lot of people I know discovered my local patch where I'm a scrubs during lockdown. Um, it's a large park in West London surrounded by urbanity. And I'd go there even in the height of summer in the middle of the day and there'd be hardly anyone there. And most people were put off because of the notorious prison of the same name. That's, that yeah. they, I might bump into a jailbird, let alone any kind of other bird. <laughs> um, and they didn't turn up. Do you think that people are put off um, getting involved in nature or even thinking about it because they feel that they need to know all the names and be an expert? Yeah, yeah massively, massively. I think um, there's a lot of barriers that, that, you know, as someone that writes and talks about nature, I have to make sure I'm not unconsciously upholding. So there's little things like um, if I take a picture of a bird and I post it on Twitter making sure I'm not just saying look what I saw and not saying what the bird is because if I do that I'm assuming that everyone else will know what the bird is and why I'm posting it and why it's interesting and actually there's lots of people that'll be going I don't know what it is I don't know what it is and I don't want to ask so and I think this is where being a, a journalist stands me in quite good stead because to be a good journalist you have to you you're the bridge between people who don't know anything and an expert and I, I try to carry on being that bridge and to remember what it's like not to know anything and to not know how to ask so a lot of people say to me you know I'll, I'll say something about birdsong and they'll say oh I can't do birdsong and all they mean is they haven't started learning yet you know 10 years ago I could only do a few and I've made it my business to try and stop look find it you know maybe check on an app and then listen to it a couple more times and it goes in. But you know, we forget as adults that you, that you have to learn things and that you'll be a beginner sometimes. So people write themselves off before they've even, even tried. You know, that makes me sad. So I, I always try and, I'm always, I'm always speaking to the newbies in the room, try to. Do you think that there is a need though for experts out there? Um, yeah. And that sounds like a stupid question, but. Do you think that the field naturalist, the person that knows the flowers and the, the mammals and the birds equally as well, and they can, you know, a font of knowledge, do you think oh, yeah. that that's an endangered species now in the UK? No, I don't. I think we've got a really rich history of, um, when it comes to natural history, we've got all of these little societies that were set up by all the Victorian sort of you know the, the second sons and the parsons who didn't have enough uh, enough to do and they set up you know a butterfly society or whatever and they're all still going all these little groups they all need to speak to each other more i think we, we're very fractured our conservation landscape so you end up with these groups competing for funds and stuff which is you know can be unhelpful but um but no i think i think we're doing all right i think the problems come with the communication sometimes um and with guarding knowledge instead of sharing it uh, so I go stomping around all over the place and pissing people off by kind of trying to link everyone up and telling people off for not, you know, not being inclusive or, not, or, or, or you know, not using language that everyone can understand. But it, it does annoy me. Um, yeah, people can want to hold on to that feeling of being an expert or a gatekeeper at other people's expense. Do you feel as if you are part of the conservation world? Uh, no. For a better phrase. No. 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 And do you think, looking in on this world, that 
the, the way it portrays itself and the way it conducts itself is still old fashioned. You know, we were talking about it earlier and I was saying to you that I felt that it was like a, a, a narrow road that people went down and nothing else was involved, it's just nature. When in reality, you know, culture, art, music, everything's involved. Yeah, it drives me mad sometimes. Um, I think there is, a, there is a real issue with inclusivity and with um, the way that we exclude people, not perhaps not meaning to, um, and the way that it's portrayed as, you know, it, it is a very, it's a, it's a middle class pursuit, you know, still overwhelmingly. Um, you know, I mean, even even the the beloved nature programming on TV, a lot of it is making assumptions about about how much time people have and how much money people have, and it's making assumptions about what things we should all naturally care about because we're all the same kind of people in the room, aren't we? And I think that can be really excluding for a lot of people. You know, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not an insider I, I don't want to be an insider in anything I like to I like to be on the edges of things um, but I've written for uh, I've, you know I've written books for Wildlife Trust and I've written for Wildlife Trust magazines and, and several other um, conservation bodies and one of the things that annoys me is is they they want to tell their story to the public but they don't they're not interested in what the public might want to read so there's often a big gap where they want to write about their projects that they've done in their reserves and they've not listened at all to the fact that what the public want might be what birds have you got what exciting thing happened or you know what what should i look for in in march so there's this there's this huge sort of i think the way i see it, it's a huge gap um and people you know they use a lot of uh arcane languages they'll talk about you know quarter one and quarter two and use acronyms and stuff and you just think people don't talk like that can you just talk to people normally you know bring people in speaking of that bringing people in social media do you think social media has a role to play in tomorrow's world when it comes to conservation climate change all that yeah. sort of stuff yeah, yeah, it has to, but it is, um, it's a hall of mirrors and it's, uh, it's poisonous as well as being brilliant and connecting. Um, and I think it can be quite, it, it can be somewhere where tribes form. Um, and when that happens, it becomes uh, quite poisonous and quite dangerous. And so, yeah, it's a double edged sword really, isn't it? I've seen a lot of bullying online. I've seen a lot of nastiness. I've had to change quite a lot of my settings since I've become more visible in the world because I, I you know, there's, there's some odd people out there. So I think you have to have a really stable head on your shoulders and you have to have a strong sense of self because otherwise you're, whether people fawn over you or pile on you, your sense of self will be rocked by that. Um, unless you really clearly know who you are and you've got really clear boundaries and you know what belongs to other people and why they might be saying something and that it's nothing to do with you. That's hard. That doesn't usually come till you're a bit older in life as well. Yeah, I mean, I've found that especially Twitter can be quite toxic. Yeah, absolutely. But it can be wonderful as well. It can be the yeah. most joyful, creative, connecting place. Like humans, it's just a reflection of us, isn't it? Yeah. And also you put the wrong choice of words down on a tweet and it could be all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Someone said to me recently, uh, it was a quote from a, uh, somebody's book. Uh, we're all living in a hostage video. And I thought that's a really good description of social media, that we're all a bit scared that we're about to be called out. We've all got a gun to our backs, but we're all pretending we don't have a gun to our backs. <laughs> um, for me, it's quite clear that you love Britain. Am I right in saying that? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm talking about Britain geographically, maybe not politically, but certainly yeah. as, as, a, as, a, as a place of, of, you know, where you live, basically. Would I be right in saying that? 
It's really complicated, isn't it? I'm, I've got a fascination with England as opposed to Britain. Uh, my grandmother was Anglo-Indian and my mum was born and brought up in Pakistan. And she grew up with a concept of home, which was somewhere she'd never been, uh, as being England, not Britain. And it was a very sepia tinted, you know, rose, rose tinted lenses, whatever, um, view of this country that she was supposedly, she supposedly belonged to, but she didn't know anything about. So Urdu was her first language, you know, um, my mum's. And then she came here a partition for the first time in 47 and then went back out there to live with my father when they got married and uh, my sisters and brother were born there. So my mum's idea of England was very old fashioned and very luminous. She had this picture that was taken from books like Cider with Rosie and Lark Rise to Candleford and the Miss Reed books and uh, the Little Grey Men and you know all of these books that created this rural, um, very beautiful, um, very white world uh, with a village church spire and a, and a pub and a village green and all of that. And she was fascinated by it, but she was excluded by it as well. And when they came here in 47, my uncles were refused service in pubs. Uh, Mum lived with an enormous amount of shame about her accent. And so the idea of England is really powerful for me, but really troubling. And it, it comes, you know, it's what I write about. The, the last novel um, was about this idea of England and what it, what it drives people to do and, and how alluring it is at the same time and you know we're living through a moment where patriotism shades very easily into nationalism and into darker things as well and it's very hard at the moment it can feel hard to feel that you love these islands and for that not to be in some way troubling so that's why that's a difficult question mm. have you got any other parts of the world that you love or visit regularly that aren't in these islands which aren't in the british isles no or... uh, well i used to spend a lot of time on ibiza as you may uh, imagine in my younger my younger days <laughs> uh, but it's not the unspoiled island it used to be um, and i love new york really love new york that would be somewhere i'd like to to spend a year or so but we, I'm so rooted here, you know, I really am. If I, if I, never, if I could never travel, I, I'd be gutted, but there's enough here for me to keep me interested. Okay. Um, before we kind of, I mean, it's nearly an hour already. Um, well, what I want to do at this joint is I'm to... Gonna uh, you know, I'm going to ask skull. that. You know, we've got skulls. Look at your skulls. <laughs> so <laughs> this is something that comes up in the book uh, where I describe my uh, my fox's skull which is over there I'm, I've got a bit of an obsession with um, with animal remains not an obsession just of mild interest um, and and I collect all sorts of skulls and bones and I really wanted to introduce you to this beautiful I'll hold it here so you can see it this is a skull of a woodcock can you see yeah can you see the length of its beak I mean we all know they're funny creatures but my god it's like a um it's like one of those plague masks isn't it isn't that incredible and i've got here ice are huge aren't they sorry the ice sockets are huge yeah absolutely and that's what i love you get clues about how the animal lives from their skulls and i've got look kestrel wow isn't that beautiful and i've got here now i've got all my bird ones here because because you're the urban birder so this is a red kite's talon. Wow. Isn't that yeah. massive? Can you see how big it is? Yeah. Right. And my goddaughter uh, got this for me from uh, a red kite that um, it fell out of a tree and died just randomly at the end of her grandfather's garden. 
and she texted me and I said, oh, get me something, get me something. She's got the skull and she bought me a talon. <laughs> What, and I've got a collection of, uh, I've got my, uh, my uh, barn owl pellets here as well. Large collection of barn owl pellets. This, you see, a very large one is a summer pellet. Good hunting times. These little ones, that's a winter pellet. Mm. Much smaller. Much more meagre. <laughs> that's my show and tell. Fantastic. <laughs> what, is, um, what is your favourite bird? Ooh, uh well i'm gonna i'm ooh, i'm gonna say dipper i'm gonna say dipper because we used to see them all the time when i was uh, a kid and we'd go walking on dartmoor so we'd see them in the streams a lot but i didn't know that they sang until a couple of years ago when i was on a writing trip uh, in northumberland staying in a little town called Rothbury and I was walking by the river and I could hear bird song and this was sort of was October November time and I spent ages tracking it down I was like what I've never heard that it's a beautiful little actual beautiful song and it was a dipper standing at the edge of the river and I, I was so surprised I would have thought they would sound like a kingfisher or something like that no idea they had a proper song so yeah lovely little birds and they, they there is they sing louder to get over the sound. Really? Well, that's, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. The, I know this year, um, the studies have shown that birds have been singing more quietly because they haven't had to sing over traffic noise and aircraft noise. And, uh, you know, it makes you think how much energy they're expending needlessly the rest of the time because of all of our human made noise. But then there's another counter theory, not counter theory, but people are saying that because they are singing and not hearing human hubbub, they're hearing more of their competitors, which makes them even more anxious. Well, then imagine what it was like 300, 400 years ago. They must have all been absolutely terrified the whole time. <laughs> you could be anywhere on this planet, um, notwithstanding the, um, the current pandemic. Where would you be? I would be on Buckland Beacon in Dartmoor. You can see for miles. And it's a special place we used to always used to walk to when we were when we went on holiday to Devon when we were kids. Fantastic. Okay, well, I think we come to the point of the evening where, or the part of the evening where we kind of uh, fizzle out for the first hour. Um, I just want to tell the Zoomers that tomorrow night we have um, Rick Simpson, who's going to be uh, talking about saving waders, saving shorebirds. Um, as part of his um, charity called Wader Quest. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Me too. I can't do waders. That would be great. <laughs> that would be interesting, yeah. Waders yeah. are not easy, but there's some that are very easy, like oyster catcher. And maybe I'm doing oyster catcher. <laughs> but Melissa, listen, thank you so much for sparing your time uh, to chat with me. We're just lovely. Really, really lovely chat. Thank yeah, you for having me. And I'm looking forward to spending some time, not only in the field, but on the dance floor with you. Yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, everyone else, Zoomers, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're gonna be doing the uh, after show party in a second, but um, in the meantime, all I can say at this point is thank you very much, Melissa, and keep looking up. <laughs>